Hey, I'm Chris Zeff from Make Everything, and today I'm building something that I've wanted in the shop for a long time, this heavy steel plate welding and work table. Check it out. All right, so those of you that are familiar with my channel and watch my other videos, you're gonna notice that my metal shop looks a little bit different. Um, I don't know that I've really talked too much about this, but this is my new fixture table from Stronghand. Um, now, the welding table that we're gonna be building today is really kind of to supplement this table. Now, this thing is all precision ground, perfectly flat with fixture holes, and it is epically good for welding stuff together perfectly square, perfectly flat. Now, I don't want to do like hot cutting or any sort of, you know, hammering on this table because it's really a precision ground and precision tool. So the purpose of this table with the three quarter inch top plate is so that I can heat stuff on it. I don't have to worry about it warping. I can hammer stuff out on it, use it as an anvil, whatever I got to do. Now, the main differences in the metal shop now are the two new saws that I got. Well, one new saw and one saw just put in here. So, so this right here is a Bailey BS350M. This is a very large dual mitering a horizontal bandsaw. This is an automatic saw, which means um, you flip a little lever on a piston and it automatically drops to make the cut. It automatically turns off when it's done. Now, what's unique about this saw is that the vise can slide to either side of the blade, so it can miter in both directions. Typically on a mitering bandsaw, you usually only get one side of uh, mitering. Usually you can rotate it away from the vise and that's it. Now obviously with the vise being able to move, I can spin it both ways, which is really great for cutting angle iron where you have to cut that miter in both directions. Um, this thing has a one inch blade on it. It cuts super, super straight. It has a flood coolant system. I'm not currently using it because I want to clean it out. I bought this saw used. I got a great deal on it. I paid a little less than a third of what these things cost. Um, and if you factor in shipping, I paid probably 25% of what I would have paid if I bought it new. Huge upgrade to the shop. And I set it up in a way where running along this table, I have another new saw over there that's gonna help me cut tubing. This is a Hydemech P350. You've probably seen this in some other videos. I've used it on other projects, but I've never had it set up in this room. I used to just kind of randomly plug it in in the other room. And this is really for cutting tubing specifically. I've got a blade in there that is specifically for cutting eighth wall and 16th wall square tubing. And this thing is incredibly accurate. If you've ever used a cold saw, you know they, they don't cut like a bandsaw where it makes shavings uh, and dust they actually make a chip. They consider a cold saw cut a milled cut. So if you imagine using like an end mill on a milling machine, how you get those, those large chips as it removes material. Um, this thing is so accurate and the cuts are so, so clean. Um, they look almost polished when they're done. So having these two saws and this sort of alignment between the two will allow me to cut longer stock in here and just be more efficient in the metal shop. So this one, I still need to add an outlet for and we won't be using it on this project, but I just wanted to show you guys how I've changed up the metal shop. Now let's get into this welding table. All right, so starting off this project, I'm gonna be using the new Bailey saw. Now, like I said, one of the key factors to this saw is that it's mitering. I'm going to be mitering it sort of in the conventional way, um, but that vise would be able to slide over to the right if I wanted to miter in the other direction. Now the tubing that I'm using for this is two inch by three inch by one quarter wall uh, steel bar. And this stuff is going to be, you know, really, really strong and rigid. It's pretty heavy. It weighs about eight pounds a foot. So it's going to add a lot of mass and heft to the table all around. Now I'm just cutting these pieces that I have down cutting these opposing miters so that I can weld everything up. And the setup that I have now with this sort of table off to the side and the gap uh, where my welder sits works out really well. Um, the table is made out of wood, but I lined the top with some sheet metal so it would keep from getting messed up. And it allows me to set up a really easy stop block. And there's a couple of different ways that I can do repeatable cuts with this setup. Here you can see I'm actually just clamping my material to the back fence and it is able to get me a perfect cut and a perfect match between those two pieces, which is really great. Now cutting the shorter pieces, it's a little bit different uh, in order for me to line them up and get them perfect. I cut one miter and I put off that little off cut and then I actually stack 
that piece I just cut on top of the next piece and it gets me another second registration. Um, I've talked about this in my other videos before, but if you ever have an opportunity to avoid measuring, I always find that it's more accurate. You know, when you take the human error of measuring, especially when it comes to miters, out of the equation, you're always more likely to get accurate cuts. I try to reference the piece that was cut prior in case that piece maybe is a little bit out of spec. You're always going to wind up with at least equal pieces and then your frame is going to be that much more square. Now before I weld these, I want to grind a bevel into the edge. And here's kind of the first application where you can see how this table really is super versatile. So I've got those locating pins in there and they just so happen to fit this three inch tubing perfectly. And it allows me to just drop it in without having to waste time with a clamp. And it keeps it nice and stable while I use one of these fared grinding discs to grind in a quick chamfer. Now again, normally I would use a corner square to line up these, but because the holes in this table are perfectly milled, I'm able to just put in locating pins and then use these quick hold downs to lock the pieces in place. And once everything is backed against those pins, I know that the corner is going to be perfectly square once I'm all done. The locating pins are great. Um, they hold really nice and there's almost no slop in them. So I... Every time I make a frame, I like to make two 90 degree corners and then I like to then weld the third corner and then check the fourth corner. And I've always found that going this way as opposed to maybe like running around the square, um, doing one corner at a time, I feel that this way provides you with a, with a more accurate rectangle or square, whatever you might be making. You know, it just sort of eliminates the opportunity for error. And here you can just see me welding up some of these corners, giving a finish weld. I really like welding a heavier tube like this. It's you know so much nicer than trying to weld a uh, you know that thin that thin you know eighth inch or sixteenth inch thick material. I also want to add a center bar and I'm going to use this excellent cutting method to get it in there. Now this is just to give me an extra point of attachment for the top. Like I said, I'm going to be drilling and tapping the top down, so it'll be important for me to have an extra point there. Now one of the accessories that I got with this table were these little standoff pads and they're just little quarter inch thick pads with magnets on them and what's nice is that when you have welds on the bottom side of your piece you can offset it up off the table so the welds don't affect it and then I'm using the fireball tool mag shims underneath that center bar to make sure that it's perfectly flat with the top and it's not going to add uh, any height which would then interfere with the plate or interfere with the screws. The fireball mag shims are awesome. I've had them for a couple months now and I've used them a bunch. You should definitely check them out. I'll throw a link to Jason at Fireball Tools' website down in the description. Once that piece is in, I can just do the last two little welds and uh, we're all set. All right, so now the top is welded up. Um, I made sure to shim it so I could get the center support in. And it's good, it's pretty flat. Um, I did warp it a little bit, but that's not a big deal. The way I'm gonna attach the top is actually with mechanical fasteners instead of welding. So I'll be able to correct any warp. Plus it's three quarter inch plate, so it's really not gonna move too far anyway. Um, next thing is gonna be to cut the legs. And while I have it upside down, I can weld all that stuff in and weld it right to the bottom. Now for the legs, I'm gonna use these four by four quarter inch thick column posts that I was using on another project. I have some leftover. I'm going to drag those in, cut them on the bandsaw, and get them welded on. These 4x4 posts are pretty heavy. These weigh about 13 pounds a foot, uh, but they're going, to call, they're going to create a really solid base for this thing. And again, you can see I'm using my little outfeed table to make sort of a creative stop block. I have a bar clamped to the top and then a chuck of wood underneath it, which will support the piece so that when I cut it, it doesn't drop. And this is going to allow me to cut these really repeatably. And again, I'm not doing any measuring. I'm measuring the first one, and then I'm just clamping and cutting the other three. 
Now, one of the things I was kind of learning as I was going through this project was I had put a new blade on this saw with a lot finer tooth. It's a, I believe a 10 to 12 or a 10 to 14 tooth per inch blade. And uh, getting the, the surface feet per minute dialed in was a little tricky. This saw is great because it has a DC motor that you can control the blade speed on. And I noticed that with the higher tooth blade, it actually wanted to be fed at a much higher feed rate, uh, I would assume in order to clear the chips. So it did leave me with a pretty fine cut, which was nice. And they were all really accurate and very, very square. So now I'm using these 90 degree fixture blocks on the strong hand table in order to line up these legs. And I'm gonna be trying to line this up from two directions. So I'm clamping one of those down to the table and then I'm beveling the corner of the leg material. And then I'm gonna add that onto the base and then throw in the other corner block so that I can square it up from the other side. The other thing that you may notice is that I was careful to put the welded seam of the tubing facing down. I did mess up on one of the pieces, but I wanted that welded seam facing down so that when I had to drill and tap it later, I wouldn't have to interfere with that welded seam. If you've ever drilled tubing, you know that the welded seam is always the toughest part to drill and you're most likely to break a drill bit or a tap once you hit that. I used a little ball locks to lock down the 90 degree clamp and then just some regular clamps to square this up in both directions. I'm able to throw some tacks on there and some finish welds and get this thing lined up, welded in strong and still stay really straight without any warping. It's important to bevel tubing like this, especially when you're welding. Um, this is quarter to quarter. So you wanna make sure that there's a nice spot where the tubing's a little bit thinner so you can get really good penetration. I never want this thing to move, so I wanted to make sure these welds were all super nice and strong. The setup with these two squares is really easy to get repeatable and it's pretty fast. I also found that when I was done, I was perfectly square in both directions, which is the key. These legs are about 30 inches long, so it's pretty easy to see if they get out of square. Once you get all four of them on, you can kind of sight down them. Now the base is getting pretty heavy at this point, but I'm able to still slide it around and I'm using those pads that I mentioned earlier to block the whole thing up off the table so that the wells don't interfere. With two legs welded on, I've just got two more to go. Now I have to get this thing down off the table and at this point the base probably weighs about 300 pounds. Normally I would just take my chances and roll it off the table and try not to kill myself but I have this really cool lifting cart and I wanted to see if I could use it to make this a little safer and a little easier on my back. Now this thing can lift a thousand pounds and it'll actually lift it pretty high and what's nice about it is that it's got wheels on the front and on the back so that once I get this thing on it I can roll it around the shop. It works out super well, but since there is a little bit of overhang, I throw some clamps on it so that I can just make sure it's not gonna roll or fall off on me, especially if I hit a bump or something in the, in the floor. So the front two wheels are fixed and the back two wheels pivot, so I just sort of have to kind of wheel it around like a pallet jack. I can get it into place and then I can lower it down and roll the table base off of it. This is definitely a lot easier than trying to like slide this thing off the table and just sort of fight with it until I get it down on the ground. My back was very happy about this. And already you can see the table's really flat and doesn't rock. Now I'm going to be doing some legs for this uh, with some leveling feet. And in order to mount those to the bottoms of the legs that I already welded on, I'm going to be using this 3 8 by 5 inch plate. I use the factory stop on the bandsaw to cut myself four pieces and I just run the saw down this and cut them up. And we're gonna be using the iron worker to punch these, but before we do that, we wanna do a little bit of deburring and I'm gonna to have to mark some center lines just to make sure that we get everything set up in the right spot and do some punching to uh, make sure that the center mark is properly registered on there. 
All right, so these are the leveling feet that I'm going to use for this table. These actually came off my CNC router and I replaced them with a rolling kind of caster foot. Um, now on this table, I really don't want it to move and I think I'm going to figure out another way to make it mobile. So I figured I'd repurpose these. Now, normally what I would do is I would take a heavy piece of plate and I would tap it with this thread and screw this directly into it. But I don't have this tap. It's some sort of metric thread. But I do have a couple of nuts that work on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the 3 8 plates that I just cut on the bandsaw. I'm going to punch a hole in them. I'm going to slip them over this and I'm going to weld this nut to the bottom of the plate. So the nut will always be pressing against the bottom of the foot. So the compression will always be working in its favor as opposed to say welding this nut on the inside. Now I've already kind of accounted for this additional height in the length of those legs. So all I've got to do now is head over to the iron worker and punch these. Now this is 3 8 inch plate and I'm going to put a 3 quarter inch hole in it to accommodate these. And let's see how easily the iron worker punches a three quarter inch hole through this plate. Now I've talked a lot about this iron worker. This is a 38 ton petting house mechanical. This is a 21011. It's a really amazing machine and I've really loved using it. And check this out. So once I punched all four of those plates, I decided I would kind of set this up on the table to weld these and spin them around. I just need to do a little bit of deburring. Yeah. I took some time and I ground the zinc off of these. And now I can just place them through that plate, throw a clamp on there and weld these. Now it just so happened that the 5 eighths hole in the table worked out perfectly with this size thread and I was able to do sort of a little spinning operation here where I welded the nut down to that plate while I spun the plate with my left hand. This was kind of fun. It was almost like having a little rotary positioner for a second and it was able to give me a really nice consistent weld and those nuts stayed really square to the base plates. Now in order to get these on there, I'm just lifting up one side of the table at a time. Those feet can sort of support themselves and I can just position everything nicely and actually just uh, loosen up the bolt, which will raise the plate and then get me a nice tight interference fit with the bottom of the leg. I left these overhanging so that again, the compression would be always working in my favor. The legs are sitting on the plates versus the plates being maybe like inside the leg and then having to rely solely on the weld. This is quarter inch to three eighths weld. So it's really easy to get a nice bead on there and make sure these things are going to be on there for eternity. All right, so I got the feet welded on there. Everything looks really good. Now I had a thought where I wanted to be able to roll this thing around if I have to. And my thought is to put these casters on a crossbar and then make them so that if I raise the leg all the way, the weight will be supported by the caster. I can roll it where I need to go and then I can bring it back down. Now I don't want to make it so that the table winds up too high um, when it's off the caster. So I'm going to need to offset the casters up a distance. I'm going to need to offset the casters up a, an inch and a half. So if they're an inch and a half, if the crossbar is an inch and a half above this plate, I think if I tighten this all the way down, there should still be plenty of room to roll. Maybe we'll go an inch and a quarter. So if I go inch and a quarter down and I figure out the height of my table, my table would still only be about 35 which is good. I wanted to make it so that I could keep it low um, in case I wanted to pull something off the strong hand table and bring it onto this. So inch and a quarter off of the top of this plate and I think I'll be all right. 
Now for these wheels, I'm gonna be using some thinner wall two by three tubing that I had kicking around, but I am just gonna weld them right to the bar. Um, I ground a little bit of the zinc off, but anytime you're gonna weld casters, you gotta worry about the zinc plating on the base. Um, you don't wanna weld zinc inside unless it's well ventilated. I do have my fume extractor running, so just proceed with caution if you're gonna weld casters to a piece of steel. The other risk you run with this is if you break those casters, let me tell you, it's gonna be a real pain to get them off. So kinda of do it at your own risk and make sure your casters are good enough that they're not gonna break. Once again, I'm using the fireball shims underneath these plates um, so that I can make sure these are up at the perfect inch and a quarter off of the top of the mounting plate for the leg. Um, and you can just see how those, leg, those wheels are floating above the ground. Now, if I take the leveling feet and I tighten them all the way up into the bottom of the foot, those wheels can then touch the ground and the feet will float by, you know, it's about a quarter of an inch. It's pretty tight tolerance, but by doing it this way and keeping it this tight, it allows me to keep the table relatively low even when it's resting on the leveling feet versus resting on the wheels. And if I would have used smaller wheels, they may not have been able to support the weight. Now I need to make sure that I grind the welds down on this flat. And I started out using a pretty worn flap disc. And then I remembered that I had some of the new fared Victograin grinding discs. And let me tell you, if you need to do heavy grinding, these things are unbelievable. Um, these are a light pressure disc and they use this amazing ceramic that Fair developed called Victograin. Um, this disc will just eat through material faster than anything I've ever used before. So now we're gonna be dragging in the plate. <laughs> this plate is so heavy. So my plan is to throw two clamps on this piece of plate and then two straps so I can pick it up, put it down on this and then kind of position it. Cause I think one strap, I don't know, one strap just, I don't know, maybe one strap is the way, one strap right in the center. I don't know. Let's find out. We're gonna go this side up. Oh yeah, I can get a choker. Get two chokers on it really. Cause they probably won't slide. One of the best things I ever did was put a chain fall on a beam trolley in my metal shop. Cause lifting this plate by hand would have not been fun. It weighs about 385 pounds and it is not easy to move around. There's a chance that this thing is gonna slide out. If it does, I don't want it to hit me in the stomach. At a certain point, it's gonna wanna probably, ah, no, cause the chain fall can move. And just like that, the chain fall made easy work of moving this plate. Now, since the beam trolley was able to move, I didn't have to worry about it kicking out on me. And now I can just take the tension off the hook and I'm able to try to release those straps. Now, in order to get those straps out, I'm just using a pry bar and a little piece of two by four to try to get the weight off of the actual strap and I can pull them away and slide them out from underneath the plate. Big concern here is pinching your fingers in there. That would not be a good day. And now you can see even at the close to full weight, the casters are still able to function, which is awesome. I was a little worried. I wasn't sure how much weight they would hold. They are rated for 250 pounds each, but you never really can tell with some of this stuff. So now it's time to lay out for the holes for the bolts. I'm just using a silver streak pencil here and a drywall square in order to get some registration marks. And I'm gonna be putting 13 holes in total on this top and I'm gonna be tapping them with a half 13 bolt. So I've got my mag drill up on the table now and I'm gonna be drilling the holes for the tap first. Now the tapped hole for a half 13 is a 7 16 if I remember correctly. 
And now I'm going to be drilling that straight through the one inch plate and then through the quarter inch frame. And it's going to be important that that hole is accurate and registered through the whole thing. So I had taken some time to weld little tacks on the bottom of the table that would go to the frame. And now the tacks aren't really supposed to hold the top down permanently. They're really just there so that I don't lose my alignment when I'm drilling all these holes. It's a bit of a time involved process to do all this hole drilling, but in the end, it's gonna get me the best result. All right, so what I'm doing here is I'm setting the mag drill so that the maximum depth it can drill is just through my plate um, because I don't want to drill oversized into this. I want to drill 916 slightly over half inch through the plate and then I want to tap the bar underneath it. So we're going to give this a try. This bit, drill bit was a little chewed up and I tried to sharpen it. We'll see how it does. All right, so the bit kind of lines itself up. And the part of the reason that I'm going with an oversized bit is in case this hole gets a little out of circle, I want to still be able to make sure my half inch hardware is going to get through it. So let's give this a try. So the actual uh, dovetail of the drill bottoms out when I reach uh, right through the bottom of the plate, which will be perfect. And the size, like I said, it's a little bit bigger. It's a sixteenth bigger, but that's going to be perfect because all these holes are going to line up. So now let's do the rest of the plate. All right, so now that all these holes are drilled and then kind of reamed out for the shaft size of the screw, Now's the tricky part. We're gonna tap the steel frame underneath this using this guy. This is a Tapmatic 50X. If you've watched my other videos, you see I like these Tapmatic things a lot. Now, uh, I've, I don't think I've ever seen anyone else use one of these in a mag drill, but it, uh, it works. And it's a little tricky, you know, like it, it sort of just fits in the mag drill, but it'll work. And it's going to make this process so much easier because I'm not gonna have to worry about, you know, hand tapping 15 holes. So now I have to raise this as high as it'll go, I believe. Okay. So this tap should center itself, and since I, I bored out that hole, the tap shouldn't hit the sides of this big hole. So let's give this a try. Um, I did a test on this and it worked. Hopefully it still works. What's critical about this is that this is a self-reversing tapping head. So when I go to pull it out, it'll spin itself back out and the drill only has to go in one direction. Let's see how we do. All right. Oh man, that worked so good. <laughs> it's perfect. So that worked out so good. All right. Now uh, I'm gonna have to countersink these, but let's go and tap the rest of these holes. All right, now we want a countersink for these. I've got this nice big countersink that will do the job. This is a, a one inch countersink. Let's get that chucked up in the mag drill and see how it fits. I also want to set the depth for this. Now, this is the same situation where I can set the depth that I want this thing to drill to. 
using this lock. So the first one I'm gonna have to uh, kind of figure out. And then once I figure out the depth, I'll be able to set it and get a repeatable countersink every time. I want these countersinks to all look perfect. So we're almost perfectly flush. We're gonna go a little bit deeper and we should be set. I know that's gonna be good, so we're gonna set the depth of this right there. So now I've set the mag drill so that it'll always go the same depth even on the other ones. Perfect. All right, so now with all this sort of set up, I'm able to get through the last operation of bolting these down. Having the big countersink makes it possible. Um, and if you've ever used one of these big one inch countersinks, they're such a pleasure to use because they cut such a nice chip. But I'm really happy with this method of fastening. I just think it's gonna be overall better for this table. And I think that once the top gets scarred up, the holes I drilled were accurate enough where I should be able to flip this table over or the flip the top over and use the other other side if I really wanted to. I just used some simple green to clean off some of the tapping oil and get everything all smoothed out. And you can see here using a little engineer square how flush those countersank bolts are to the top. And it's really nice um, because they don't they're not going to interfere with any work that I'm doing on top of the table. Now with the top secured, I jack the table up again using this little toe jack and I bring the legs back up. And using the toe jack just sort of makes life a little bit easier than trying to thread the legs up, you know, sort of underneath their own weight. Um, they just spin really freely once you get some weight off of those legs. Now it's on its wheels, I can kind of roll it around and position it. And I want to continue to add some bracing to the bottom so that I can add a shelf. Now for the bracing on the bottom, I'm just going to use some 2x2 two two material that I had kicking around. And again, I'm going to be using the Fireball Tools magnetic shims to get them up at the perfect height. I'm still basing them an inch and a quarter off of the top of the bottom plate. I'll weld those on and then I'm going to just make a little shelf for it that I can sort of store stuff on and also just add some more mass to the table to keep it from moving around once it's in place. One of the things you might notice here is I've got a little headlamp attached to my welding hood. And this is something I did a couple of months ago because a lot of times when you're welding underneath something, it's just hard to see the start of your weld and you're flipping your hood on and off. The little headlamp I put on there was like 10 bucks and it made a big difference and just helped my welding in the dark places you know, obviously once you get the arc struck, you can see what you're doing, but before then it's a little hard to see. Now the shelf I just made out of three quarter inch plywood and I painted it black. I'd like to put some steel down there, but at the time I don't have any in stock that I can spare to make such a big shelf. Getting it back up on the wheels again, I grind around the outside edges because there was a little bit of a sharp burr and then the last thing I'm gonna do is just add a hammer rack. Now the hammer rack I built, I didn't film me welding it up, it's very simple. It's an inch and three quarter gap between two pieces of one by one, and I'm just gonna weld it onto the side and just make sure that it's nice and square. I had a hammer rack on my last table that used to be over here, and it was really helpful because this is sort of where all my blacksmithing equipment goes. So having all my hammers in one place will just be nice and I can easily grab them. And if I wanna modify the hammer rack or add to it, it's pretty easy to do. Now the moment of truth to figure out the final weight. And I did a little giveaway on my Instagram for people to guess, and it was fun. Um, you know, people got pretty close. One guy got within one pound. Um, and while you're watching this, try to figure out if you can guess how much this thing's gonna weigh. Um, I had a rough idea, but when it came in, you know, over 650 pounds, I was really happy. 
665 was the total weight and that's without anything on it. So once I add some stuff to that bottom shelf, add a vise and you know, whatever other accessories, it's just gonna help ground this thing to the earth. You know, I don't wanna bolt it down, um, but I do wanna make it so that it's really solid and it really doesn't go anywhere. Now I'm still able to roll it, which is fantastic. And the way that I did those wings, it can sort of stick around in that corner a little bit easier. And again, I just use the toe jack to back the legs down and make this thing land. I also specifically made it the correct height so that my stronghand table, which is behind me, um, I could straddle work between the two. And if I needed to level it, I could just use those leveling feet. Overall, I'm super, super happy with how this thing came out. It's exactly what I wanted in the shop. I can't wait to keep using it and doing some modifications to it. There's something cool about the way those bolts look on the top too. And I gave it a heavy coat of some anti-spatter to keep it looking nice. All right, that about does it for this video. I'm super happy with how this thing came out. Like I said, I've wanted one of these in the shop for a long time. Um, I recently upgraded my main welding table to this unbelievable four foot by eight foot build pro table from Stronghand Tools. This thing is incredible and it has absolutely changed the way that I work in my metal shop. The only thing about that table is that it's so nice that I don't want to you know, bang parts around on it and flame cut on it because it's really not that type of table. It's for precision work and I still need to do a little bit of muscling around every once in a while. A table like this is gonna be awesome to have. The three quarter inch plate top is super, super heavy duty and I don't really have to worry about warping it with hot parts and I can do a little more rough work on this. So in complement to the strong hand, I think this is absolutely gonna be essential to my shop moving forward. I wanna thank Lincoln Electric for providing me with my 360 MP welder that I used on this project. If you're looking for a large multi-process welder, the 360 MP is incredible. And also a huge thank you again to Stronghand for providing me with the Build Pro Max table. If you have any amount of precision work that you need to do or repeatable work that you need to do in your metal shop, you absolutely have to look in to a build pro table. Um, having those precision milled holes and those super flat tops, I'm able to build stuff like this, which obviously is a little more of a utility based object, but you know, I built the frame of this and I barely even had to check it with a square. Everything is super accurate and I use it for furniture bases, which this kind of is all the time. So check out the build pro max table. There'll be links down in the description. Thanks so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, leave them down below. I did a fun little giveaway on this table on my Instagram, which you can follow here, where I had people guess the finished weight so they could win some Make Everything merch, a hat. And also, if you're interested in supporting the shop, I do have sweatshirts, t-shirts, all sorts of stuff on my store, and there'll be a link to that down below as well. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like this video and leave a comment down below if you have any questions. I've got a bunch of projects coming up that I'm gonna use this table for and a bunch of really cool restorations and things I wanna to add to this table in the future that are gonna just make it that much better. So don't forget to subscribe to my channel so that you can be here to tune into all that. Thanks so much for watching. Again, I'm Chris Zeff from Make Everything and I hope to see you on the next video. Macklin's coughing in the other room. I've got a bunch of projects coming up. <laughs>